go ahead and run your experiments in Iceland. Let's run that for 50 years and see what happens. It's weird how everybody's obsessed with running the experiment in America, right? To balance the long run budget on the kind of the backs of the poor and the middle class. Anything that lowers the innovation in the world's most innovative countries has negative costs for the entire planet in the long run. But that's something you'd only see over the course of 20, 30, 50 years. And libertarians and open border advocates are very rarely interested in that kind of time frame. But it's worth thinking through why it is that the successful so-called monarchies aren't really monarchies, right? They're really oligarchies. We should presume that the average skill level of voters, the average traits that we're bringing from our ancestors are having an effect on our current productivity for good or ill. Okay, today I have the pleasure of speaking with Garrett Jones, who is an economist at George Mason University. He's most recently the author of The Cultural Transplant, How Migrants Make the Economies They Move To a Lot Like the Ones They Left. But he's also the author of 10% Less Democracy and Hive Mind. We'll get into all three of those books. Garrett, welcome to the podcast. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, first question, is, isn't the cultural transplant still a continuation of your argument against democracy? Because the, isn't one of the reasons we care about the values of migrants, the fact that we eliminate democracy? So should we view this book as part of your critique against democracy rather than against migration specifically? Um, well, I do think that uh, governments and productivity are shaped by the citizens in a nation in, in almost any event. Um, I think that even as we've seen recently in China, even in a, a very strong authoritarian dictatorship, which some would call totalitarian, even there, the government has to listen to the masses. So the government can only get so far away from the masses on average, even in uh, an autocracy. If you had to split apart the contribution, though, um, the, the impact of migrants on, let's say, the culture versus the impact that migrants have on a country by voting in their political system, um, uh, how, how would you split that apart? Is, is, the, is mainly the impact we, the cultural impact we see for migration due to the ability of migrants to vote or because they're just influencing the culture just by being there? I'll cheat a little bit because we don't get to run experiments on this, so I just have to kind of guess. Uh, make an informed guess, I, I'm going to call it 50-50. Um, so the way people, uh, the way citizens influence a country through formal democracy is important, uh, but citizens end up placing some kind of limits on the government anyway. And the people in a country are the, they're the folks who are going to work in the firms and be able to either establish or not establish those complicated networks of exchange that are crucial to high productivity. I want to linger on hive mind a little bit before we talk about the cultural transplant. Um, if you had to guess, do, do the benefits of national IQ come from having a right tail of elites that is smarter? Or is it from not having that strong of a left tail of people who are, you know, low productivity, more like likely to commit crimes and things like that? In other words, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, the upper tail is going to matter more than the lower tail um, in, in the normal range of variation. Uh, and I think part of that is because uh, nations, at least moderately prosperous nations, have found tools for basically reducing the influence of the least informed voters and for uh, basically being able to keep productivity up even when there are folks who are sort of disrupting the whole process. Um, you know, the, the, the risks of crime from the lower end is basically like a probabilistic risk. It's not like it's, it's not like some... Uh, zero to one switch or anything. So we're talking about something probabilistic. And I think that uh, it's the, the median versus the elite is the, is the contrast that I find more interesting. Um, uh, median voter theorem, you know, normal, the way we often think about democracy says that the median should be matter more for determining productivity and for shaping institutions. Um, and I tend to think that that's more important in democracies for sure. So when we look at countries, if you just look at a scatter plot, just look at the raw data of a scatter plot. If you look at the few countries that are exceptions to the rule where the mean is the mean IQ is the best predictor of productivity compared to elite IQ, um, the exceptions are non-democracies and South Africa. So you see a few uh, places in the Gulf where there are large migrant communities who are exceptionally well-educated, exceptionally cognitively talented. Um, and that's associated with high productivity. Those are a couple of Gulf states. It's probably Qatar, the UAE, might be Bahrain in there, I'm not sure. 
Um, and then you've got South Africa. Those are, the, those are the countries where the average test score, it doesn't have to be IQ, it could be just PISA, TIMS type stuff. Um, those are the exceptions to the rule that the average IQ, the mean IQ is the best predictor of national productivity. Uh, interesting. Um, does that imply the fact that the, um, at least in certain contexts, the elite IQ matters more than the left tail? Does that imply that we should want a greater deviation of IQ in a country? That you uh, just push a button and increase that deviation. Would that be good? No, no, I don't think so. Uh, Okay, if you could just increase the deviation, um, holding the mean constant. Yeah. Yeah, I think so in the normal range of variation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, it, and I think so, that it had more effects. It, you know, it's people at the top who were, um, tend to be coming up with the, the big breakthrough, the big scientific breakthroughs, the big intellectual breakthroughs that end up spilling over to the whole world. Basically, the, the positive externalities of innovation. This is a very almost Pollyanna ish. Uh, Paul Romer, new endogenous, new uh, new growth theory thing, right? Which is the innovations of the elite just swamp uh, the negatives of the low skilled among us. Can we just apply this line of reasoning to low skilled immigration as well? Then that maybe the average goes down, the average IQ of your country goes down if the if you just let in you know millions of low skilled immigration uh, immigrants, and maybe there's some cultural effects to that too. But, you know, you're also going to that, that the elite IQ will still be preserved and more elites will come in through the borders along with the low skilled migrants. So then, you know, since we're caring about the deviation anyways, uh, more immigration might increase the deviation. Uh, and then, you know, the, we just uh, that's a good thing. So notice what you did there is you you did something that didn't just uh, increase the variant. You simultaneously increased the variant and lowered the mean yeah, and yeah. median. Right. And so I think that. Uh, Hurting the mean and median is actually a big cost, especially in democracies. And so that is very likely to swamp uh, the benefits of um, the, small, the small probability of getting higher elite folks in as part of a low-skilled immigration policy. So pulling down the mean or the median is that that's a that's that swamps that swamps the benefits of increasing grades there. Yeah. Yes. But if you get rid of their migrants' ability to vote, and I guess you can't do that, but let's assume you could do that. Yeah. What yeah. exactly? It like how, what is the exact mechanism by which the 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 cultural values or the lower median is impacting the elite's ability to produce these valuable externalities? You know, like there's a standard comparative advantage story that you know they'll they'll do the housework and the cooking for the elites, and they can be yeah. more productive. Yeah. And we'll, yeah. Taking all the institutions as given, which is what a lot of open borders optimists do. They take institutions as given. They take cultural norms as given. Um, all that micro stuff works out just fine. I'm totally, I'm totally on board with all that sort of Adam Smith division of labor, blah, blah, blah. Um, but institutions are downstream of culture. And uh, cultural norms will be changing partly because of what I call spaghetti theory, right? We meet in the middle when new folks come to a country there's some kind of convergence, some part where people meet in the middle um, between the, the values uh, that were previously existing and the values that have shown up uh, that migrants have brought with them. So, you know, like I, I call it spaghetti theory because um, when Italians moved to America, that got Americans eating more spaghetti, right? And if you just did a simple assimilation analysis, you'd say, wow, everybody in America eats the same now, like the burgers and spaghetti. So look, the Italians assimilated, but migrants assimilate us. Um, uh, Native Americans certainly changed in response to the movement of Europeans. Um, English Americans certainly changed in response to the migration of German and Irish Americans. So this meeting in the middle is something that happens all the time and not just through democratic channels, just through the sort of soft contact of cultural norms that sociologists and social psychologists would understand. Um, now I'm sure you saw the book that was released, I think in 2020 called, titled, uh, Wretched Refuse. Uh, where they showed a slight positive relationship between uh, immigration and, you know, pro-market uh, laws. And I guess the idea behind that is their selection effects in terms of who would come to a country like America in the first place. Well, but they also... never ran the statistical analysis that would be most useful, I think. They said that, uh, so this is Powell and Naraste. Yeah. They ran a statistical analysis that said, and they said, in all of the statistical analyses we've ever run, we've never found negative relationship between low-skilled migration any measure of it and changes in economic freedom. And um, I actually borrowed another one of Powell's data sets 
And I thought, well, how would I check this theory out? The idea that changes in migration have an effect on economic freedom. And I just used the normal economist tool. I thought about how do economists check to see if changes in money, changes in the money supply change the price level? That's what we call the quantity theory, right? Mm -hmm. The way you do that is on the x-axis, you, you show the change in the money supply. And on the y-axis, you show the change in prices, right? This is Milton Friedman's idea. Money is always yeah, yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Inflation is always everywhere monetary phenomenon. So that's what I did. Uh, I did this with a, with a, um, a student. Uh, we co authored a paper doing this. And the very first statistical analysis we ran, we looked at migrants who came from countries that were substantially more uh, corrupt than the country's average. And we looked at the, the different, the relationship between chain, an increase in migrants from corrupt countries and subsequent changes in economic freedom. Every single statistical analysis we found had a negative relationship. We ran the simplest estimate you could run, right? Change on change. Change in one thing predicts change in another. They somehow never got around to running that very simple statistical analysis. One change predicts another change. Mm. Oh, we found negative that. relationships every time. Sometimes statistically significant, sometimes not. Always negative. Somehow they never found that. I just don't know how. <laughs> But what about the anecdotal evidence that in the U.S., for example, the in the periods of the greatest expansion of the welfare state or of government power during the New Deal or Great Society, the levels of foreign-born people were at like historical lows? Uh, is that just a coincidence, or what, what do you think gives? I'm not really interested in uh, migration per se. Right, my story is never that like migration per se does this bad thing. Migrants are bad. That's never my story. Right, mm -hmm. as you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But my story is that migrants bring uh, cultural values from their old country to their new country. And sometimes those cultural norms are better than what you've got. And sometimes they're worse than what you got. And sometimes it's just up for debate. So if you had to guess, what percentage of the world has cultural values that are equivalent to or better than the average of America's? Oh, equivalent to or better than? Yeah. Uh, I mean, just off the top of my head, maybe 20%? I don't know, 30%? I'll just throw yeah, something yeah. out there like that. Yeah. So, I mean, like... For country averages, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, currently, we probably don't have... Uh, it, it would probably be hard for, like, 20% of the rest of the world to get into the U.S. Um, w w would you support some pro uh, possible policy that would make it easy for people from those countries specifically to get to the U.S., just uh, have radical li immigration liberalization from those places? Um, that's really not my comparative advantage to have opinions about that, but, like, substantial increases of people who pass multiple tests, like let's take the low hanging fruit and then move down from there, right? So people from uh, countries uh, that ha um, on average have say higher savings rates, um, higher uh, education levels, higher S when I call SAT deep root scores and um, countries that are say half a standard deviation above the US level on all three, right? Why do they have to be higher? Why not just equivalent? Like uh, you get I mean, all the gains from the like, trade and plus it can't be, you know, equivalent. So it's there's no, no trade. Part there. of the reason is because the entire world depends on U.S. innovation. So we should make America as good as possible, not just slightly better than it is. So very few firms would find that their optimal hiring policy would be hire anyone who's better than your current stock of employees. Would you agree with that? Yeah, but you have to pay them a salary if you're just, uh, you, if it's just somebody just comes to the U.S., you don't have to like pay them a salary, right? So. If somebody is better, that if somebody's producing more value for a firm than the salary would pay them, I think like is, is, a, is a firm's job to maximize its profits or to just make a little bit more than it's making right now? Maximize profits, but yeah, there you go. So you, pack, okay. you find the best people you can. You know, you know uh, sports teams that are hiring don't just say we want to hire people who are better than what we got. They say let's get the best people we can get. Why not get the best? That was yeah, Jim, Jimmy Carter's. That was Jimmy Carter's uh, biography. Why not the best? But you, you can do that along with getting people who are, you know, in ex unexpected uh, terms, but as good as the existing Americans. That why would, gives you all I, the don't, I don't get what you, why you want this. This seems like crazy, right? What are you talking about? But I, I, I'm not sure. What, why not what the best? trade out there? Huh? No, I, I'm not saying you don't get the best. But I, I'm saying once you've gotten the best, what is the harm in getting the people who have equivalent SAT scores and, and the rest of the things you mentioned? I think part of the reason would be, You'd want to find out, I mean, if you really want to do something super hardcore, you'd have to find out what's best for the planet as a whole. What's the trade-off between um, having the very best 
uh, most innovative, talented, frugal people in America doing innovating that has benefits for the whole world versus having an America that's like 40% better, but where the median's a little bit, the median of skills a little bit lower, right? Uh, because the median shaping the productivity of the whole team, right? This is what you, you know, what, what it yeah. means when you believe in externalities, right? But if you have somebody who's equivalent, by definition, they're not moving the median down. That's, you're, you're totally right about that. Yeah. But like, why wouldn't I want the best thing possible, right? Okay. I, I'm still trying I, to figure out why you wouldn't want the best thing possible. You're trying to go, let's start why I don't want the best thing you. possible. I'm like, why not? I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just, yeah, yeah. I'm a little bit confused about why that, that precludes you from also getting the second best thing possible at the same time. You're, Cause you're not limited to just the best, right? Well, uh, because the second best is going to have a negative externality on the first best. Everything's the externalities. Negative. This is my worldview, right? Everything's externalities. You bring in the second like best, you're like, you're not, that person's going to make things on average a little worse for the first best person. But it seems like you were explaining earlier that the negative externalities are coming from people from countries with uh, low SAT scores. And by the way, SAT, you can explain what that means just for the audience who's not familiar with how you're using that term. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, there, there are three prominent uh, measures in what's known as the deep roots literature and uh, that are widely used. Uh, two are S and A, that's state history and agricultural history. That's how many thousands of years your ancestors have had experience living under organized states or living under settled agriculture. And then the T score is the tech history score. I use the measure from 1500. It's basically what fraction of the world's technology were your ancestors using in 1500 before uh, Columbus and his expansive conquest ended up upending the entire world, uh, the world map. So S, A, and T are all predictors of modern prosperity, but especially when you adjust for migration. Gotcha. We can come back to this later, but one of the interesting things I think from the book was you have this chapter on China and the Chinese people as a sort of unstoppable force for free market capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, as you mentioned in the book, that China is the poorest majority Chinese country. Um, what do you think explains why China is the poorest uh, majority Chinese country? Maybe are there like nonlinear dynamics here where uh, if you go from 90, 40 to 90 percent Chinese, there's positive effects. But if you go from 90 to 95 percent Chinese, there's too much. No, I think it's just I think just communism is dumb and it has terrible, like sometimes decades long effects on institutional quality. That I don't really quite understand. So I'd say North Korea, if we had good data on North Korea, North Korea would be even a bigger sort of deep roots outlier than China is, right? It's like, don't, don't have a communist dictatorship in your country it seems to be pretty, a robust lesson for uh, national prosperity. China's still stuck with a sort of crummy version of that mistake still. North Korea, of course, is stuck with an even worse version. So I think that's, I, my hunch is that that's, you know, the overwhelming issue there. Um, it's, it's something that it's, it's sort of a, China's stuck in an, in, currently China's stuck in an institutional cul-de-sac and they just don't quite know how to get out of it. And it's uh, bad for a lot of for the people who live there on average. If the other side had won the Chinese civil war, things would probably be a lot, lot better off in China today. Yeah. Um, but what, what does that suggest about the deep roots literature? If the three biggest countries in the world, China, India, and America, um, it, it under predicts their performance or sorry, in the case of China and India, it, uh, it, it over predicts their performance. And in the case of America, it under predicts. Does that suggest that maybe the, how, how reliable is this? If like the three biggest countries in the world are not uh, adequately accounted for? Uh, well, you know, communism is a really big mistake. I, I think that's totally accounted for right there. Um, I think India's underperformance isn't that huge. Um, the U S is a miracle along many ways. Um, it's we should draw our lessons from the typical country. And I think uh, population weighted estimate. I don't think that basically one third of the knowledge about the wealth of nations comes from the current GDP per capita of China, India and the US. Right. I think much less than one third of the story of the wealth of nations comes from those three. And uh, again, in all, in all three cases, though, if you look at the economic trajectories of all three of those people, all, all three of those countries, uh, they're all uh, China and India growing faster than you'd expect. And also, I want to point out, this is the most important point, actually. Um, when we look at, uh, when Kaplan made this claim, right? Brian Kaplan has made this claim, right? Yep. That the SAT, yep. that the ancestry scores, the deep root scores don't predict uh, the prosperity of uh, the, the low performance of India and China. He only checked the S and the A in the SAT scores. Okay. 
Which letter did he not predict? Which letter did he never test out? He never yeah, tested yeah. the T. What do you think happens when he tests the T? Does it predict uh, China and India and America? They start, they, T goes back to being statistically significant again. Uh huh. So with T, which we've always known as the best of the deep root scores, somehow Kaplan never managed to measure that one. Just as Powell and Naraste never managed to run the simplest test, change in uh, migrant corruption versus change in economic institutions. Somehow, like the simplest test just never got run. Okay. And then what is the impact if you include T? If you, if you, if you look at T, then, um, then uh, contrary to what Kaplan says, uh, the deep root, that deep roots measure is statistically significant. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, the puzzle goes away. <laughs> interesting. Uh, yeah. So somehow these guys just never seem to run like the simple things, the transparent things. I don't know why. The um, the weird um, the 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 one you mentioned from what was it Narasa, the name of the guy who wrote the Richard at Refuse. The yeah yeah, and uh, Paolo Naraste. Yeah yeah. That you said you did the regression on institutional corruption uh, and from the countries that come from. Is that was that right? I, so yeah, the the measure they use. I just took I took Powell's yeah. data set from another study, and it was yeah. the percentage of it was basically um, the percentage of your nation's population, the percentage increase in your nation's population from relatively poor or corrupt countries. They had multiple measures. Uh huh. So, and, and what is on the y-axis there? Y-axis is change in economic freedom. That's my preferred one. Gotcha. There's also a change in corruption one, which is a noisier indicator. Uh, you get much clearer results with change in economic freedom, so. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, now, does the idea is getting harder to find stuff and great stagnation, does that imply we should be less worried about impinging on the innovation engine in these uh, countries that people might want to migrate to? Because worse comes to worst, it's not like there are a whole bunch of great new theories that are going to come out anyways. Uh, no, I think that I think that it's always good to have great things um, and new ideas. Yes, new ideas are getting harder to find, but um, that but that the awesome ideas that we're still getting are still worth so much, right? If we're still increasing lifespan a month a year uh, for every year of research we're doing, like that just seems great, right? A decade that adds a year to life. So just to use a rough uh, ballpark measure there. But so we have a lot of these countries where a lot of innovation is happening. So uh, let's say we kept a, a one or two of them as, you know, immigrate uh, as havens from any potential uh, downsides from radical changes. You know, we already have this in the case of Japan or South Korea. There's not that much migration there. Mm -hmm. What is what is a harm in then using the other ones to decrease global poverty by immigration or something like that? Well, um, it's obviously better to create a couple of innovation powerhouses um, rather than none, right? So obviously that's that's it. But instead, I would prefer to have uh, open borders for Iceland. If the open borders advocates are right and open borders will have no noticeable effect on institutional quality, then it's great to move, have our open borders experiment run in a country that's lightly populated, has a lot of open land, and um, has good institutional quality. And Iceland fits the bill perfectly for that. So we could preserve the institutional innovation skill, uh, the institutional quality of the, the what I call the I-7. Uh, that's you know, China, Japan, South Korea, the US, Germany, UK, France and choose any country out of the hundred, out of the couple of dozen countries that have good institutional quality, just pick one of the others that aren't one of those seven. Pick one that's not an innovation powerhouse and turn that into your open borders uh, country. Um, you could, uh, if you wanted to get basically Singapore levels of population density in Iceland, that'd be about 300 million people, I think. I think that's about what the numbers end up looking like, something like that. But so the you entire... Can play but, but the value of open borders comes from the fact that you're coming to a country with high agglomerations of talent and capital and other things, which is uh, no, not true of Iceland, right? So it, it isn't the entire... <laughs> no, no, no. I thought the whole point of open borders is that there's institutional quality and there's some exogenous institutions that make that place more productive than other places. Mm -hmm. And so by move, I, I, that's my version of what I've been exposed to as open borders theory is that institutions exogenously exist. There's some places have uh, moderately laissez-faire institutions in their country, and moving a lot more people there will not reduce the productivity of the people who are currently there, and they'll become much more productive. And so, like, the institute, you know, the institutional quality is crucial. So, I mean, if you're a real geography guy, you'd be excited about the fact that Iceland is so far, so close to the North Pole, because yeah. latitude is a predictor of prosperity. 
Um, I want to go back to the thing about well, well, should we have open borders for that twenty percent of the population, global uh, world's population that comes from yeah. um, equivalent SAT and other sort of cultural traits as America? Because um, mm-hmm. I feel like this is important enough to dwell on. Yeah, you know, it, it seems similar to saying that once you picked up a hundred dollar bill on the floor, you wouldn't pick up a twenty dollar bill on the floor because you only want the best bill. Uh, the twenty dollar bill is right there. Why not pick it up? Um, so what once if we the- have. Yeah. What if the twenty dollar bill makes your turns your uh, hundred dollar bill into like an eighty dollar bill and turns all of your eighty hundred dollar bills into eighty dollar bills? But is it, aren't you controlling for that by saying that they have equivalent scores along all those cultural tests that you're considering? No, because um, the median. So, so take the simple version of my story, which is the median of the population ends up shaping the productivity of everybody in the country, right? Or the mean, right. the mean skill level ends up shaping the productivity of the entire population, right? So that means we end up, I mean, I, I try not to math this up. I don't want to math this up for the, you know, in a popular book, but it means we face a trade-off between being small, a small country with super awesome uh, positive externalities for all the workers by just selecting the best people. And every time we lower the average skill level in the country, we're lowering the average productivity of everyone else. But we're creating... What if we didn't, what if we didn't lower it? So it, it, you have to have skills that are lower compared to greater the, than the median of a uh, median American. You so know, it, this, this is a Cedric Faribus story, right? Like if you could suppose the U.S. is at 80 now on a zero to 100 scale, right? It's just to say the yeah, yeah. And you have a choice between being 100 and being 99. If you're 99, the 99 is making all, compared to the world of average of 100, the world of an average 99 is making, reducing the productivity of all those hundreds. Okay. If we chose 90, we're reducing the productivity of all those hundreds. Yes. Okay. So let's say we admit all the smartest people in the world and that gets us from 80 to 85. That's a new, uh, that's a new median in America. At that point, and but this is because we've admitted a whole bunch of like 99s that have just increased our average. Yeah, yeah. Um, at that point, open borders for everybody who's above eighty five. Like I, this is this is ends up being a math problem. It's a little hard to solve with a podcast, right? Because it's the it's the question of do I want a smaller country with super high average productivity, or a bigger country with lower average productivity? And by average productivity, I don't just mean a uh, uh, a compositional effect. I mean negative external. I mean relatively fewer positive externalities. So I'll use the term relatively fewer positive externalities rather than negative externalities, right? So like, I don't exactly know where this is trade off going to pan out, but um, there is a case for a sort of Manhattan. When people talk about a Manhattan project, right? They're talking about putting all like a small number of the smartest people in a room. And part of the reason you don't want like the 20th smartest person in the room is because that person's going to ruin the ruin stuff for, all, for the other smart people. I, I'm, when we th- I'm, I'm, it's amazing how your worldview changes when you see everybody as an externality. I, I'm kind of confused about this because the, the, just having at some point you're going to run out of the smartest people, the remainder of the smartest people in the world. If you've admitted all the brilliant people, yeah. yeah. Given how big the U.S. population is to begin with, you're not going to change the median that much by doing that, right? So it's it, it's almost equivalent to just having more births from the average American. Like if, if the average American just had more kids, the population would still grow. Mm-hmm. And the relative effect of the brightest people might dilute a little bit. Um, but uh, and that maybe that's a huge tragedy. We don't know without a bunch of extra math and a bunch of weird assumptions. We don't know. So like I, there's a point at which I have to say, like, I don't know. Right. OK. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is diluting the power of the smartest person in America, like keeping us from having wondrous miracles all around us all the time? I mean, probably not. But I don't know. But, but I guess the sort of the meta question you can ask about this entire debate is, listen, there's so much literature here and it's hard to tell what exactly will happen. You know, it's possible that culture will become worse. It's possible it will become better. It's possible it's stay the same. Given the fact that there's this ambiguity, why not just do the thing that on the first order effect seems good? And, you know, just like moving somebody who's like in a poor country to a rich country, first order effect seems good. I don't know how the third and fourth order effect shapes out. Let's just, you know, let's just do the simple, obvious thing. I, I thought that the one of the great ideas of economics is that we have to worry about secondary and tertiary consequences, right? But if we, if we can't even figure out what they are exactly, why not just do the thing that at the first order seems uh, good? Um, because if you have a compelling reason to think that the uh, direction of strength of the second and third and fourth order things are negative and the variances are really wide, then you're just adding a lot more uncertainty to your outcomes. So... And adding uncertainty to your outcome that has sizable negative tail 
especially for the whole planet, isn't that great. Go ahead and run your experiments in Iceland. Let's run that for 50 years and see what happens. It's weird how everybody's obsessed with running the experiment in America, right? Why not run it in Iceland first? Because America's got a, great, a lot of great institutions, right? They, but we can check and see what happens. Iceland's, Iceland's a great place too. Uh, and I use Iceland uh, as a metaphor, right? Like it's people yeah, are obsessed yeah. with running it in America. Like there's some kind of need. I don't know why. So let's try in France. Um, let's try. Our, let's try Northern Ireland. Uh, are, are places with low SAT scores, and again, SAT, we're not talking about the, uh, in case you're skipping to this timestamp, we're not talking about the college test. The um, deep root SAT, exactly. uh, state history, agricultural history, tech history. Yeah. Right, exactly. Are, are those places with uh, low scores on um, on that test, are they stuck there forever? Or uh, is there something that can be done if you are a country that has had a short or not significant history of um, technology or agriculture? Well, the, I start off the book with this, which I really think that uh, one thing they could do is uh, create a welcoming environment for large numbers of Chinese migrants to move there persistently. I don't think that's, of course, the only thing that could ever work, but I think it's something that's within the range of policy for at least some poor countries. I don't know which ones, but uh, some poor countries could follow the uh, approach that many countries in Southeast Asia followed, which is create an environment that's welcoming, welcoming enough to Chinese migrants. Um, it's the one country in the world with large numbers of high SAT score, uh, uh, with, a, lar with a high SAT score culture, large population. It's enough of an economic failure so for at least a little longer that uh, folks can might be able to be interested in moving to a poorer country with lower SAT scores. In a better world, you could do this with North Korea too, but the population of North Korea isn't big enough to make a big dent in the world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, China's yeah. population is big enough, yeah. Another thing you have to worry about in those cases, though, though, is the risk that if you do become successful in that country, there's just going to be a huge backlash and your resources will get expropriated. Yeah. Like what happened Famously to, so uh, in, in Indonesia, India. right? Yeah, there have been many oh, yeah, yeah. times across yeah. Southeast Asia where anti-Chinese pogroms have been, um, uh, unfortunately, a fact of life. Yeah, yeah. Or Indians in Uganda under uh, Idi Amin. Idi Amin, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, actually, I'm curious how you would think about this. Given the impact of national IQ, um, if you're an effective altruist, what, uh, are you just uh, handing out iodine tablets uh, across across the world? What, what are you doing to increase national IQ? Yeah, this is, this is something that I, yes, uh, finding ways, I, this is what I call a, a Flynn cycle. Like, I wish... I'm hoping for a world where there are enough public health interventions and probably K through six education interventions to boost test scores in the world's poorest countries. And I think that ha ends up having um, uh, a virtuous cycle to it, right? As people get more productive, then they can afford more public health, which makes them more productive, which means they can afford more public health. I think brain health is an important and neglected part of child development. Um, Fortunately, we've done a fair amount to reduce the amount of environmental lead um, in a lot of poor countries. That's probably having a good effect right now as we speak in a lot of the world's poorest countries. You're right. Um, iodine, basic childhood nutrition, uh, reliable health care uh, to you know, prevent the worst kinds of just mild childhood infections that are probably uh, creating what, the, what, they, what economists sometimes call health insults things that end up just hurting you in a way that causes uh, an ill-defined long-term cost. A lot of that's going to have to show up in the, in the brain. Um, I'm a big fan of the, of the view that part of the Flynn effect is uh, basically nutrition and health. Uh, mm -hmm. Flynn wasn't a huge believer in that, but I think that's um, certainly important in the poorest countries. Yeah. Um, uh, I think Brian showed in Open Voters that if you look at the um, IQ of adoptees from poor countries um, who go, uh, Sweden is the only country that collects data, but if you get adopted yeah. by a parent in um, uh, Sweden, uh, the the half the gap between the averages like of those two countries yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. goes away. Yeah. So, I mean, it is one of the ways you can increase global IQ just by moving kids to uh, countries with good health outcomes that uh, will nourish their intelligence? Oh, that's a classic short run versus long run effect, right? So uh, libertarians and open borders advocates tend to be focused on the short run static effects. So, um, and so you're right, moving kids from poor countries to richer countries is probably going to raise their test scores quite a lot. And uh, then the question is, in the, over the longer run, are those uh, lower skilled folks, the folks with lower test scores, 
uh, going to degrade the institutional quality of the places they move to, right? So if you close half the gap between the poor country and the rich country, half the gap is still there, right? And if I'm right that IQ has big externalities, then moving people from a, a lower scoring country to a richer scoring country and closing half the IQ gap still means on net you're creating a negative externality in the country the kids are moving to. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, we can come back to that, but... Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, it's it basically you just look at the question, is this lowering the mean test scores in your country? And if it's lowering the mean test scores in the long run, it's on average going to lower institutional quality, productivity, savings rates, those things. Um, it's hard to avoid that. Or it's hard to avoid that outcome. So, uh, I don't remember the exact figures, but didn't Brian address this in the book, um, in the Open Borders book as well? That you can, even if there's a the national IQ uh, lowers on average, if you're just uh, if you're still raising the global IQ, that that is still nets out positive, or am I remember that wrong? Well, that, notice what he's he, what he does is he attributes. Uh, he says there's some productivity that's just in the land, that's just geographic factors. So basically yeah. being close for, and so that basically moving people away from the equator boosts productivity substantially. And again, that's a, a static result. Um, the reason I, uh, I mentioned that ignores all the I-7 stuff that I'm talking about, where anything that lowers the um, level of innovation in the world's most innovative countries has negative costs for the entire planet in the long run. But that's something you'd only see over the course of 20, 30, 50 years. And Libertarians and open border advocates are very rarely interested in that kind of time frame. Is there any evidence about uh, the impact of migration on innovation specifically? So not on the average institutional quality or on, you know, uh, the, the corruption or whatever, but like just directly the amount of innovation that happens or maybe the Nobel Prize is won or things like that. Um, no, I mean, I would presume I think a lot of us would presume that uh, the European invasion of North America ended up having. Uh, positive effects for global innovation. It's not an invasion that I'm in favor of, but if you want to talk of crudely about yeah, yeah. whether migrations had an effect on innovation, uh, you'd probably have to include that as any kind of analysis. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that the people who are currently Americans, but their ancestry traces back to countries with low SAT scores, it, it, is it possible that US GDP per capita would be higher mm -hmm. without that contribution? Or how do you think about that? I mean, that it follows from thinking through the fact that we are all externalities, positive or negative, right? I don't know what in, in any particular, any one particular country could turn out to be some exciting exception to the rules, some interesting anomaly. Uh, but on average, we should presume that the average skill level of voters, the average uh, traits that we're bringing from uh, the nations that are the nations of our, of our ancestors are is having an effect on our current productivity for good or ill. It's just following through the reasoning. I'd have to say on average, that's most likely, uh, but it, there could always be exceptions to the rule. I guess we see large disparities in income between different ethnic groups across the world, not just in the United yeah. States. Doesn't that suggest that some of the gains can be privatized from whatever the cultural or other traits there are? Because if these over decades and centuries, these sorts of uh, these sorts of gaps continue. I don't see where that would follow, right? Um... Uh, if everything is being, if all the externalities are just being averaged out over time, wouldn't you expect that these ga gaps would uh, narrow? Well, I mean, I'm being a little rhetorical when I'm saying everything's literally an externality, right? I don't literally believe that's true. Uh, for instance, people with higher education levels do actually earn more than people with lower education levels. So that's literally not an externality, right? So some of these other cultural traits that people are bringing with them from their um, ancestors, nations of origin, um, could be one or one likely one source of these income differences. I mean, if you think about differences in frugality, uh, differences in personal responsibility, which show up in the surveys uh, that are persistent across generations, those are likely to have an effect on long run productivity for you yourself and your family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let alone the hive mind stuff where you find that there's a positive relationship between test scores and, and productivity. There was a blogger who took a look at your 2004 paper about the um, impact of national IQ on um, on G, uh, GDP. Um, and they calculated, so th they were just speculating, let's say you cloned a million John von Neumanns and as assume that John von Neumann had an IQ of 180. Then you could, uh, let me just pull up the exact numbers. You could, um, you could raise the average IQ of the United States by 0.21 points. Um, and if it's true that one IQ point contributes 6% to uh, G increasing GDP, then this proposal would increase U.S. GDP by 
uh, 1.26%. Uh, Do you buy these kinds of extrapolations or... 1.26%? Uh, yeah, yeah, because you're only cloning a million John Monroe. Oh, yeah, okay, so it's about 1 million John Monroe. Yeah, yeah, that sounds... Uh, I mean, that's the kind of thing where I wouldn't expect it to happen overnight, right? I tend to think of that... Uh, the IQ externalities of being two, three generations. I, I lump it in with what economists call organizational capital. That sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I can't remember where I saw this. I think I, I stumbled across it myself at some point too. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, yeah. his name is Alvaro de Menard if you want to find Oh, okay. Him. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, I mean, in the, it's in that ballpark, right? It's just this idea that, and, and more importantly, um, a million John von Neumanns would be a gift to the entire planet, right? Yep, yep, yep. So yeah, if you had a if you had a choice of which country to have the John von Neu the million John von Neumanns, uh, it's probably going to be one of the I seven. Maybe there maybe there's a maybe Switzerland would be a good alternative. What is the optimal allocation of intelligence across a country? Because one answer, and I guess this is the default answer in our society, is you just send them where they can get paid the most because that's a good enough proxy for how uh -huh. much they're contributing. Yeah. And so you have these high agglomerations of talent and intelligence in places like Silicon Valley or New York. Um, and, you know, because their contributions there can scale to the rest of the world, this is actually where they're producing the most value. Another is, you know, you actually you should disperse them throughout the country so that they're helping out communities, they're, you know, mm -hmm. teachers in their local community. Um, I think there was uh, a result, there, there was an interesting anecdotal evidence that during the Great Depression, the crime in New York went down a ton. And that was because the cops in New York were able to hire the, you know, they had like a hundred applications for every cop they hired. And so they were mm -hmm. able to hire the best and the brightest. And they, they, there were just a whole bunch of new police tactics and every, that were pioneered at the time. Anyways, mm -hmm. so is the market allocation of intelligence correct? Or do you think there should be more distribution of intelligence across the country? How do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the market signals are terrible, uh, but uh, this is my, my inner Paul Romer kicks in and says, uh, innovation is all about externalities and there's market failures everywhere when it comes to the uh, field of innovation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I personally, I mean, I, I like the idea of finding ways to allocate them to, to STEM style, STEM style technical fields. And, uh, we do a fair amount of that. And maybe we do the, maybe the U S does a pretty good job of that. I don't have any huge complaints at that at the at the crudest fifty thousand foot level, um, for our, the you know the fact that people know that there's a uh, status game they can play within academia that are perhaps more satisfying or at least as satisfying as the sort of corporate hierarchy stuff. So yeah, yeah, I, I you, you don't want them all just. I wouldn't encourage them to solely follow market signals, right? I'd I'd encourage them to be more Hansonian and uh, play a variety of status games because the academic. Um, and intellectual status game is worth a lot, both personally and then it leads to positive spillovers for society. But how about the geographic distribution? Do you think that it's fine that there's people leave, uh, smart people leave Kentucky and go to San Francisco or? Yeah, I'm uh, a big agglomeration guy. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm a big agglomeration guy. Yeah. I mean, the internet makes it easier, but then like still being close to people's, being in the room is important. Um, that there's, there's something, uh, both Hansonian and Girardian here about like, we need to find <laughs> role models to imitate. And that's probably important for productivity. Um, are there increasing or decreasing returns to national IQ? No, I think, um, you know, my findings were that it was all basically log linear. And so log linear looks crudely like increasing returns, right? So... Yeah, it looks exponential, right? So yeah, there's increasing returns to national IQ. Yeah, are, are you, uh, but, but this is this is a commonplace finding in a sense because so many uh, like human all the human capital relationships I'm familiar with end up having something like a log linear form, which is exponential. So why is that? Um, yeah, there's something multiplicative. That that's ha what I have. That's all I have to say. Is like it's something. Somehow this all taps into Adam Smith's pin factory and we have multiplicative, not additive effects when we're increasing brain power. I, ha um, I suspect it does have something to do with uh, a, a better organization of the division of labor between people, which ends up having something close to, to uh, exponential effects on productivity. Are, uh, are you a fan of genetic selection for intelligence? 
uh, as a means of increasing national IQ, or do you think that's too much playing at the margins? If it's voluntary, I mean, people should be able to do what they want. And um, after a couple of decades of experimentation, I think people would end up finding a path to uh, government subsidies or tax credits or something like that. I think people voluntarily deciding what kind of kids they want to have um, is uh, a a good thing. And so by genetic selection, I assume you're meaning at the most elementary level, people testing their embryos the way they do now, right? Yep. So, I mean, we are, we already do a lot of genetic selection for intelligence. Um, anybody you know who's a, a, in their mid-30s or beyond who's had amniocentesis, they've been doing a form of genetic selection for intelligence. So it's a widespread practice already in our culture. Um, and uh, welcoming that in a voluntary way is probably going to have good effects for our future. What do you make of the fact that GPT-3, or I think it was Chad GPT, had a measured IQ of 85. Yeah, I've seen a few different measures of this, right? You might've seen multiple measures. Um, Yeah, I think it's it's a sign that basically, and and when you see people using non-IQ tests to sort of assess the outputs of GPT on um, long essays, it does does seem to fit into that sort of, not quite a hundred, but not not off by a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a sign that a lot of, mundane, even fairly complex, moderately complex human interactions can be simulated by a large uh, language learning model. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's uh, going to be rough news for a lot of uh, people whose life was in the realm of words and dispensing simple advice and solving simple problems. That's pretty bad news for their careers. I'm, I'm disappointed to hear that. So, yeah, yeah. Um, At least for the uh, transition. Hopefully. I don't know what the, I don't know what's going to happen after the transition, but yeah. I'm hoping yeah. that's not true of programmers or economists like you. I mean, it might be, right? I mean, it's, if that's the way it is, I mean, I, that, I mean, the car put a lot of uh, people who took care of horses right out of out of work too. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, even okay. So let's talk about democracy. That, I thought this was also one of your really interesting books. No oh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Even controlling for how much democratic oversight there is of institutions in the government, there seems to be a wide discrepancy of how well they work. Like the Fed seems to work reasonably well. I, I don't know enough about macroeconomics to know how the object level decisions they make, but mm-hmm. you know, it seems to be a non-corrupt, like uh, technocratic organization. Um, enough. The, but yeah, it, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you look at something like the FDA, it's also somewhat insulated from democratic processes. It seems to not work as well. Mm-hmm. What determines uh, controlling for democracy? What controls, uh, what, what determines how well an uh, institution in the government works? Well, I, I think... Um... In the case of the Fed, it really does matter that they, uh, the people who run it have a guaranteed long term and they print their own money to spend. So that means that they're basically Congress has to really make an effort to change anything of the Fed. So they really have the kind of independence that matters, right? You know, they have a room of their own. And uh, the FDA has to come to Congress for money more or less every year. And the FDA, uh, Heads do not have any kind of security of appointment. They're appoint- they serve at the pleasure of the president. Mm-hmm. So I do think that they don't have real independence. Uh, I do think that they're basically, um, they're living in this slack, this area of slack, to use the sort of McNoll gas poli sci jargon. They're living in this realm of slack between the fact that the president doesn't want to me- uh, muddle with them, uh, meddle with them, excuse me, and the fact that Congress doesn't really want to meddle with them. But on the other hand, I really think that that the FDA and the CDC are doing what Congress more or less wanted them to do. They reflect mm-hmm. they reflect the muddled disarray that Congress was in over the period of, say, COVID. Mm. Uh, that I think that's a first order importance. I mean, I do think that it's the fact that uh, FDA and CDC don't ha- uh, seem to have that culture of um, raw technocracy the way the Fed does. That I think that has to be important on its own. But I think behind that, some of that is just like FDA, CDC creatures of Congress much more than the Fed is. Should the power of the president be increased? Uh, no. No, like the power of independent committees should be increased. Like more of Congress should be like the Fed. Uh, my plan for a Fed, re- for an FDA or CDC reorganization would be about making them more like the Fed where they have appointed experts who have long terms and they have enough of a long term that they can basically feel like they can blow off Congress and build their own culture. Mm-hmm. 
So uh, the European Union is an interesting example here because they also have these appointed technocrats, but they seem more interested in creating anno annoying pop-ups on your websites than with dealing with yeah. the, you know, the end of economic growth on the continent. Is this a story where more democracy would have helped or how do you think about the European Union in this context? No, in the EU, like uh, the European, European voters just aren't that excited about democracy. Uh, excuse me, aren't that excited about markets overall. The EU is going to reflect that, right? Um, what little evidence we have suggests that uh, countries that are getting ready to join the EU, they improve their economic freedom scores, their sort of laissez-faireness mm. uh, on the path to getting ready for uh, joining the EU. So, and then they may increase it a little bit afterwards once they join. But basically, it's like, it's like uh, when you're deciding to join the EU, it's like you decided you have your Rocky training montage and get more laissez-faire. And well, so the EU on net is a mess. It, it pulls in the direction of markets compared to where uh, Europe would be otherwise. I mean, just look at the nations that are in the EU now, right? A lot of them are um, east of Germany, right? And so those are countries that don't have this great, you know, uh, history of being market friendly. And a lot of parties aren't that market friendly. And yet the EU sort of nags them into their version, like as much markets as they can handle. So. What do you think explains the fact that the Europe, uh, Europe as a whole and the voters in there are less market friendly than Americans? I mean, if you look at the sort of deep roots analysis of Europe, you would think that they should be the most uh, most in favor of, I don't know if the deep roots, uh, actually maybe the I mean, planet that, but- Yeah, compared yeah. to the planet as a whole, they're pretty good, right? So um, I, I'm, I never get that excited about like the small little distinctions between the US and Europe, like these 30% GDP differences, which are very exciting to- pundits and bloggers or whatever. I'm like, 30% doesn't matter very much. That's not really my bailiwick. What I'm really interested in is a 3,000% between the poorest countries and the richest countries. So like I can speculate about Europe. I, I don't really have a great answer. I mean, I, I think there's something to the, the naive view that um, the Europeans with the most, uh, what my dad would call gumption, are those who left and came to America. Some openness, some adventurousness. Uh, and maybe that's part of what trans uh, made... So basically, there's a lot of selection working uh, on the migration side to uh, make America more open to laissez-faire than Europe would be. Does that overall make you more optimistic about migration to the U.S. from uh, anywhere? Like, you, you know, the same story. Of yeah, center of pair of us. Like, America, right. America gets people who are really great, right? I went with you there. Yeah. Does um, elite technocratic control work best in only in high IQ countries? Because... Otherwise, you don't have these high IQ elites who can make good policies for you, but you also don't get the democratic protections against famine and war and things like that. Oh, I mean, I don't know. I think I think the case for for uh, handing things over to elites is pretty strong in anything that's moderately democratic, right? Um, I don't have to be anything that's substantially more democratic than the official measure of Singapore, for instance. I mean, that's why my book, 10% Less Democracy, really is targeted at the rich, rich democracies. Once we get too far below uh, the rich democracies, I figure once you put elites in charge, they really are just going to be old-fashioned Gordon Tullock rent seekers and steer everything toward themselves and not give a darn about the masses at all. So that's, you know, uh, elite control in a democracy... A lot of elite control in any kind of democracy, I think, is going to have good effects if it's re you're really looking at something that is a uh, that meet the Martia Sen's definition of a democracy: competitive market, competitive parties, free press. Mm -hmm. Does Singapore meet that criteria? No, because their parties aren't really allowed to compete. I mean, right. that's pretty obvious. Yeah, the right. the pa the People's Action Party really controls uh, party competition there. So. But it, I guess Singapore is one of the great examples of technocratic, um, technocratic yeah. control. And they're just uh, an yeah, exception to the rule. Most countries that try to pull off that lower level of democracy wind up much worse. So, what is your uh, what is your opinion of neo reactionaries? I guess they're not in favor of ten percent less democracy. They're more in favor of hundred percent less democracy. But yeah, I think uh, they're like kind of too much larping, too much romanticizing about the Rohirrim. I guess I don't know. What is the Rohirrim? Yeah, all the these guys in the Lord of the Rings, you know, romanticizing monarchy is a mistake. Um, it's worth noting that, uh, as my colleague Gordon Tolick pointed out, as along with many others, uh, in equilibrium, kings are almost always king and council, right? 
And so it's worth thinking through why king and council is the equilibrium, something more like a corporate board and less like um, either the libertarian ideal of the entrepreneur who who owns the firm or the monarch who has the long-term interest in being a stationary bandit. In real life, there's this sort of muddled thing in between that works out as the equilibrium, even in the successful so-called monarchies. So it's worth thinking through why it is that the successful so-called monarchies aren't really monarchies, right? They're really oligarchies. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you look at the median voter in terms of their preferences on economic policies, it seems like they're probably more um, in favor of government involvement than the actual policies of the United States, for example. Yeah. What explains this? Shouldn't the medium voter theorem imply that we should be much less libertarian as a country? Than yeah, that's a great point case? from um, Brian Kaplan's excellent book, yep. Myth of the Rational Voter, right? Yeah, I think part of it, I mean, I think his stories are right, which is that uh, politicians facing re-election have this trade-off between giving voters what the voters say they want and giving the voters the economic growth that will help politicians get re-elected, right? Mm. Um, so it's uh, it's a version of saying like, you know, I don't want you to pull off the Band-Aid, but I want my wound to all get better. So then, so the politician has to, it's the politician's job to handle the contradictory demands of the voters. And by delegating authority to them, uh, to the voter, to the elected politicians, you get some of the benefits of elitism, um, even in a so-called democracy. Um, over the long run, should we expect any of the tensions or all the tensions of ethnic diversity to fade away? Like nobody today worries about the different Parisian tribes in France butting heads at the workplace, right? So over yeah, time, and, and, yeah, some... and you're right, like that, uh, the uh, anti-German ethnic sentiment in the U.S. totally gone, right? So right, yeah. but yeah. over time, so then this this is one, another one of those short run effects that you uh, emphasize we should focus less on, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, it's possible you don't know which. I mean, the problem is that ethnic ethnic conflict has been a hardy perennial. It's not the only conflict that people can ever have. I don't, I don't know to what extent uh, they'll, these things will fade away. As I emphasize in the culture transplant, the ethnic diversity channel is actually the least important of any of the channels I discuss. Um, and so I'm open to this thought that what you're saying will actually happen. And maybe we'll just find something else to get mad at each other about, like um, uh, social media tribes or uh, religi religious groups. Um, I mean, it hasn't happened yet in all the documented human history we have. People seem to find some ethnic uh, balance for conflict. It is worth pointing out that the one, one um, study that I report, uh, I think it's a Wagyar co-author piece, find that when the, the real, uh, the source of ethnic conflict happens when private values are correlated with um, ethnic groups, right? So if uh, cultural values are basically uncorrelated with ethnicity, then basically there's nothing to fight over. And that's really what's happened with a lot of old ethnic battles in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're right. Some of these things will fade with time. The problem is that human beings are one of our great evils is that we are always looking for a focal point and we can people will use visible appearance as a horrifying focal point around which to uh, peg their conflicts. It's an easy one because our brains are looking for visual patterns. And I don't like that, but it's something that will probably keep happening. One of the interesting points you made in the chapter was that the uh, benefits of diversity are greatest when search costs are lower and the cost of vetting are lower. What do, how, how do we make sure that that is true of non-elite professions? So if you're looking for a plumber or if you're looking for a carpenter, how, how do you make sure that you can vet them easily? I mean, I have to say that this has to be a case where like you know, Yelp and Google and all these online ratings have given us tools for checking these things out. We know we have to be skeptical, of course, but uh, for people who know that they're good at something, the cost of entry into a new field has to be much lower than it was a few decades ago because, you know, 10, 20 good Google reviews um, and you can actually enter. So, yeah, lower, basically not not banning, not banning disclosure of data. I'd say that's the most important thing we can do. Mm -hmm. um, I think um... you sometimes hear that medical doctors, I haven't checked up on this in a long time, but apparently medical doctors often uh, make a very risky to give bad reviews sometimes you get lost you get a lawsuit or something mm -hmm. so making that a lot harder is worth it you know we know that some negative reviews are going to be malicious and inaccurate but the benefits of information flow seem really high yeah 
I thought one of the really interesting chapters in the the 10% less democracy was the chapter on, you know, bondholder democracy. Yeah. And I'm curious. So, I mean, corporations are ex- uh, obviously an example to use here where they do have bondholders who hold them accountable. Mm-hmm. But the average lifespan of a corporation is 10 years, I believe. So do you think it'd be, it would um, it would be even shorter if bondholders had a lesser say on corporations or, you know, what, what is the what is the transience of the corporation tell us about their controls? Oh, that's a good point. Um, well, we, we can suspect that the average person who's investing in a corporation makes money, right? Because uh, otherwise people wouldn't be doing it, right? On average right. people, it must work. Um, so this is what, Ryan, you actually have me stumped here. So can you rephrase the question again? I'm trying to think through what the, what the sure. question is there. Yeah. If bondholders do extend the longevity and the long-term yeah. thinking of the organizations on, on who oh, they yeah. hold bonds, why aren't corporations who give out bonds, why don't they tend to live longer than I think the average of 10 years? It, would it be even shorter without bondholders or? It, oh, I, I'd say, I, A, I'd say it'd probably be shorter without bondholders or any yeah. kind of financial monitor. But second, most corporations yeah. just shouldn't live that long, right? Most corporations, <laughs> their ideas that you try out and then it like, you find out it, it doesn't work or it should be bought up by somebody else or the IP should be sold off. And so having a lot of companies uh, fade out is actually on net a good sign. I think this is really part of the John Haltewanger line of research, the, the sort of modern version of creative destruction research, which finds that, you know, uh, low productivity firms exiting, you know, just as naive laissez-faire predicts, means that those workers and that capital can get reallocated over to more productive firm. So the alternative is, uh, you know, stereotypically Japanese zombie firms, right? They're kept limping along by banks that are perhaps under political pressure to lend. And so a lot of, a lot of ca- human and physical capital gets tied up in low productivity projects. Yep. So yeah, um, uh, a brutal bond market is a, a good way to send a market signal to move capital from low productivity to high productivity projects. Um, why are yields on 30 year, uh, fixed, um, treasuries, why are they so low? Because theoretically investors should know that we have a lot of liabilities in the form of, you know, social security to baby boomers and that we've radically inflated the money supply very recently and may do so again. Uh, do you think the investors being irrational with the uh, low yields or what's going on? No, no. I'm a fan of the view that the bondholders are going to win in the long run. And that uh, inflation, any kind of super, like super, super high inflation is not going to be the path uh, of the future. And what's going to happen is that at least think about the U.S., um, the way the bondholders are going to win is that there's going to be a mixture of tax hikes and slower spending growth, especially hurting the poor. And that's how the U.S. is going to close its fiscal gap. I don't know particularly what paths other countries are going to go through, but the U.S. has this basically... Um, this one tool, this one superpower sitting, um, sitting in the room that it hasn't used yet. And it's, oh, it's a VAT, right? So the U S could dramatically increase its tax revenue through either an overt or disguised value added tax. And that would raise a ton of money, just like it raises in Europe. And that would, that's the easy way to close the U S fiscal gap. We probably won't even have to get to that. Just making Medicaid worse slowly over the long run, um, (laughs) maybe making Medicare worse over the long run. All right. Uh, that, that by itself would close a lot of this fiscal gap. So basically, I think they'll balance the long run budget on the kind of the backs of the poor and the middle class. That's probably the most likely outcome. So are you expecting... So hence, no, hence no hyperinflation. So. Are, are, but so you're expecting the welfare state to shrink either in quality or quantity over time? In relative terms, uh, compared to the trend. I mean, if America's still getting, say, 1%, 1.5% richer each year... Um, then that by itself uh, means that you know, you know that adds a certain level of quality to healthcare over time, and so basically, if it if it ends up staying the equivalent of say zero percent, uh, that by itself, if you get healthcare spending in, in real terms to be zero percent over time, um, that that would end up closing the gap when you compound it out long enough, right? So, yep, yep, yeah, um, that kind of thinking. So, you know, when List Trust try, in the UK tried to implement uh, tax reform, there uh-huh. was a bondholder revolt and, you know, she was ousted. Yeah. Uh, bondholders so, won right do, there. Yeah. So do you, do, you, are we, do we already live in the bondholder utopia or? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I mean, I think that that was a nice uh, reminder that basically 
contrary to sort of the MMT view um, and the sort of pop MM, the pop Keynesian view, the debt is no barrier at all. Um, I think that showed the bondholders uh, are actually paying attention to long-term signals of fiscal policy credibility and they'll take action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well what are the deep roots of Mormonism? Why do they have such high trust and uh, uh, such tight knit communities? I mean, I think part of it is that they are, they reflect a lot of this sort of uh, what for then was Western pioneer culture, upstate New York, Pennsylvania, then Ohio. Um, I think those communities tended to be uh, high trust communities necessarily because of the difficult uh, environment that they were living in. Um, and there was a lot of selection. There was a lot of selection over the first few decades of Mormon history where those who were willing to sort of trust the group stayed in and those who weren't willing to trust the group um, ended up leaving. And not just trust, but trustworthiness. I think a lot of people probably got weeded out because they weren't contributing to the common good. So I think that basically by the time the Mormons got established in Utah, uh, they they had already selected for a strong culture of... Um, a kind of, a kind of in-group pro-sociality. And I think that's um, helped them, that helped them weather the storms of the 19th century. So the whole 19th century, people were only joining uh, during this, this is during the era of polygamy in Utah, right? Um, if they thought that they were willing to put up with this, right? And you know, you're, you're signing up for some kind of deep sociality with a mixture of a lot of unconventional stuff. And that foundation uh, really helped. And the fact that Mormons since then have stayed as a religion that requires a medium high level of, of commitment also weeds out people who just aren't willing to make that kind of commitment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was, I was raised Mormon. Um, you know, I wasn't ultimately willing to make the commitment. And maybe part of the reason is because I'm too much of a free rider. So Mormons who are left are probably better than me. Um, the Mormon church has, I think, more than $100 billion in assets. Uh -huh. What is it planning on doing with all this money? That's a, that's a, tremendous, that's a tremendous sum. I don't know. I mean, maybe they're planning to hand it to the savior when the second coming happens, right? It's, uh, there's, there's gotta be a great argument for this option value of just having the wealth there, right? It does, it must give them a kind of independence from the world when various storms come along, cultural, political storms. Um, you know, I don't actually know what their plans are for what they would do with all the money. But I do know that like normal economics tells us that just pe being frugal is good for the economy overall. So Stephen Landsberg has a great uh, essay in Praise of Scrooge. It's especially appropriate for this time of year. And um, being frugal means you're building up the capital stock and you're giving uh, a sort of invisible gift to future generations. So Mormon frugality is basically helping build up the U.S. capital stock and indirectly the world's capital stock, helping make us all more productive, which I think is something that fits in with Mormon values. Yeah, yeah. I think people have pointed out that people should be spending more money given the fact that they have so much left over by the time they die, usually. Yeah, but, uh, as, you, as an individual yeah. level, if you care about your own well-being, that's true. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah but okay, so if you, it, it, it's interesting. Like, leaving a large inheritance is, uh, is, so, is socially valuable. Yeah, leaving a large inheritance means there's, uh, you're leaving, you're, you're, you're producing a lot, but you're not consuming very much. So that means right. you're building up the capital stock. So. Yep, yep. Um, and... It, it, there's also, I think, um, a, a large amount of uh, multi-level marketing schemes that proliferate in Utah. Yeah. Is that one of the downsides of high social trust? Yeah, because people predate upon it, right? It strikes me as right. a total rent seeker sort of thing. I mean, I have to say the knives are really good. So I'm a, uh, <laughs> everybody I know who's ever had Cutco knives ends up using them for decades. So that's one of the popular multi-level marketing schemes that actually gets to, to men. A lot of them are targeted at, at women through cosmetics, as you might know. So. Mm -hmm. but yeah. at least the men's one it works out if you had to implement an immigration system from scratch would you actually uh, would you actually consider these sat scores and these other deep root scores as part of somebody's admittance or would you just consider the individual level um your personal skills and education and things like that no i'd want to launch a 10-year maybe 20-year research project of figuring how to turn the deep root scores into something useful so i like i uh I think right now with the deep roots literature, we're about where Milton Friedman's monetarism was in the late 60s. You know, Friedman said, hey, I figured out where inflation comes from and we'd be a lot better off if we just grew the money supply 3% a year. And ultimately, nobody thought he was right about the 3% a year thing. But they did think that 
he had a, still had a lot of good advice. So Friedman ended up having a lot of good ideas, but they weren't policy ready. And I think that's about where we are with the deep roots literature right now, which is, um, I mean, at most one would use it as a, like a small plus factor in a point system, but I don't even know which points I'd use. But something yeah. along those lines is worth thinking about. I would never use a cutoff. I would never use any uh, quotas or hard cutoffs. Uh, if you think about points-based systems, 10, 20 years of further research, and maybe you'd find a way to put the deep roots into a points-based system. Yeah, yeah. Um, How was the SBF thing? What do you mean? So did he just say, like, I'll fly you out? So I was there for the um, EA Bahamas. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then while I was there, I, I, um, I, I talked to somebody who knew him. And I'm like, hey, I would love to interview him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. would ask him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was one of the ones where I actually I feel like I would really want to redo that one because I was aware of some things back then that were kind of, that we were yeah. worth asking about in retrospect. And of course, it's all in retrospect, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, I should have poked harder at that rather than asking these sort of philosophical questions about effective altruism. Yeah. Do you think, I, I mean, is it as simple as like he was commingling fun? Uh, he, he lent a bunch of FTX money over to a hedge fund and then they lost it? Um, I, I, yeah, I'm guessing. First approximation? Guess, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like, um, it's old fashioned financial fraud, partly driven by uh, not having a really good board over him or a good oversight. You know what? I'm really curious to ask you this because, you know, you talk in hive mind about the fact that higher IQ people on average um, are more cooperative in prisoner's dilemma type situations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just interviewed Bethany McLean on the podcast. It hasn't been released yet. But, you know, she wrote The Smartest Guys in the Room, which about Enron, right? And yeah, so yeah. Th there is this thing where maybe they are less likely to commit fraud on average, but when they do, they're so much They're really good at it, it, right? Exactly, yeah. right? Um so yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe one of the downsides of having a high IQ society is that when people do commit fraud, they're super successful at it. Uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I mean the the evils of of super smart people are obviously a huge risk to all of humanity, right? right? I don't have to worry about humanity being wiped out by a bunch of people with sticks and stones, right? I have to worry about yeah. humanity being wiped out by nuclear weapons, which could only be invented by smart people. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, are are smart people? Co more cooperative in a sort of very calculating sense that, you know, this game is going to go on. So I want to make sure I preserve my relationships or even in the last turn of a iterated prisoner's dilemma game, even in the last turn, they would cooperate. You no, in the I last mean? turn they walk away. Yeah. 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 I think, yeah, it, but... I think the, um, there is no correlation between uh, intelligence and say agreeableness, right? Normal psychological mm -hmm. agreeableness. And I think that's a broader principle or conscientiousness for that matter, right? Psychological conscientiousness. So Machiavellian intelligence, I think, is what's driving the link between IQ and cooperation. So in repeated game, that Machiavellian intelligence, which a lot of intelligence researchers will talk about, turns into Kosian intelligence where people find a way to grow the pie. But it's a very right. cynical, self-interested form of growing the pie. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I don't think that has any... Um, I don't think it's driven by inherent prosociality. I think it's it's endogenous prosociality, not exogenous prosociality, and that's a reason to worry about it. What is, what happens to these high IQ people when if society goes into a sort of zero sum mode where there's not that much economic growth, and so the only way you can increase your share of the pie is just by cutting out b bigger and bigger slices for yourself? Yeah, yeah. like you, then you are got to watch out, right? It's yeah, like the Middle yeah. Ages, right there, right? Yep. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, interesting. Um, awesome. Uh, Garrett, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. This was interesting. Hey, thanks I, I really for having me. It's been fantastic. Yeah. Yep, excellent. Thanks for reading my books. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course.